Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to students and educators from Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta, and welcome to a learning uplink with the Canadian Space Agency. My name is Marilyn Steinberg, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's event, an event which emanates from the Aquarius habitat on the sea floor of the Atlantic Ocean off the Florida Keys. Before I proceed with some introductions, I would ask that all video conference sites place their microphones on mute throughout the following presentation and until such time as I call on your site for a question. Your learning host this afternoon is a veteran of space flight, having completed two missions, the first to the Mir Space Station and the second to the International Space Station, where he delivered Canadarm2 and became Canada's first spacewalking astronaut. Chris Hadfield is the third Canadian astronaut to take on the moniker of Aquanaut and is the NEMO 14 mission commander. Please help me welcome Canadian astronaut and Aquanaut Commander Chris Hadfield. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I can see um, people, I think, at all locations. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where we are in this place, and then uh, some of the stuff we're doing down here. And then um, after that, see if I can answer some of your questions and answers as uh, Marilyn just, just said. Where I am, let's start with where I am. I am under the ocean, I'm on the bottom of the ocean. This wall here, is a few centimeters thick of solid steel. These windows are 10 centimeters thick of, uh, of like a plastic type of glass so that the crushing weight of the water doesn't come bursting inside. And I'm really inside a bubble, a bubble of air maintained by this steel balloon inside at the bottom of the ocean, keeping us alive. Because we're deep below the water, there's, there's pressure that actually pressurizes the air around us. So it's, uh, it's not a normal environment. We're down here living in a very unusual and what would be a dangerous place. Right now, up in space, there are 12 people on the International Space Station. They're inside a metal bubble with the walls that hold them and protect them from the environment on the outside. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm here is because we want to be able to train to go up there. How do you build something on Earth that gets people and gets equipment ready to go and explore the rest of the universe? If, if we ask you to go and do this, we want you to go and explore an asteroid, find out what asteroids are made of, find out how to deflect an asteroid so it won't hit the Earth. How would you train? We're underneath the water. If you look in the window, this is Nate Bender, one of our uh, HAB technicians looking through the 10 centimeter glass showing you where I truly am down at the bottom of the ocean. And behind him is the blue of the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> the blue of the Gulf of Mexico and uh, unlimited fish. Um, and so we have a place like this to train uh, for working in space, to develop techniques, to understand how the human body behaves, to learn how to explore. We call it an analog, sort of uh, uh, like an avatar, but for as a place. And, and this particular avatar or analog allows us to go and really experience what space flight's gonna be like. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the technology that will keep us alive and that's why we have things like this helmet that allow us to breathe underwater. The second is to figure out all of the procedures. How are we going to do this? How do we communicate with the ground? What do we do? The third is what happens to our bodies and how do we stay happy and healthy? And we have experiments that are looking at all three of those things. How do you keep everybody alive in a hostile environment? How do you test and develop procedures for exploration? and how do you measure and take care of their bodies all at the same time. So that's what we're doing down here. We call it NEMO, which stands for, which of course is stolen from uh, Captain Nemo and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Jacques Cousteau and all of the historic explorers. But this is the NASA 
Extreme Environment Mission Operations down here in the Aquarius facility. So for me, it's really cool that Atlantis, the first space shuttle that I ever flew in, is currently docked at the space station. They're building a piece onto the space station, just like I had a chance to do. And meanwhile, we're down here learning how to explore, develop exploration here on the bottom of the ocean. So I have all this equipment around me, but I think what I'll do is I'll get to people's questions, and we'll use this equipment, and maybe Nate, if he comes back to the window. And while you're talking to me, sometimes when one of the big fish go by, you can, you can see the local environment that I'm living in. We'll use all of these things around me to try and help explain and answer some of the questions that you have. So back to you, please, Marilyn. Thanks for the overview. I uh, just want you to know that we have some 1,500 students online with us today, several of whom are definitely ready to ask uh, you some questions. So let's begin with a question from Darby Wilkinson from County Central High School in Alberta. The question is, why is the seabed considered a good planetary exploration analog? Okay, and my apologies, Darby, if you asked the question, I, uh, I didn't hear it, but thank you for repeating it, Marilyn. When you land your spaceship on another planet, if this uh, can of cocoa roast almonds was your spaceship landing on another planet, then as it comes down and touches down, of course, the amount of gravity holding it on the surface depends on the size of the planet. If it lands on Earth, we have this much gravity, and things fall this fast. If we were on the moon, it would only have one-sixth the gravity. If we were on an asteroid, it would have very little gravity at all. It would fall really slowly. So one of the reasons we're under the ocean is we can go outside, and by putting different amount of weights in our body, we can simulate as if we were standing on Mars, or as if we were on the moon, or as if we were on an asteroid, and then we can start developing the equipment that will let you explore. The spacesuits, the rovers, the landers, all of the standard equipment. And so it gives us an easy way where we can go out every day for week after week to practice and develop without having to go back up and down or, or uh, only be able to stay on the bottom for a short period of time. So it lives us constant, long-term access to an environment that simulates the surface of another planet. Question is from Anamvir Kaur from Beaconsfield High School in Quebec. Question is, what do you do as a mission commander for an uh, EMO-14? Thank you for the question. I think it was Anamvir, if I heard the name properly. Um, I'm the mission commander. We are six people for two weeks in a very hostile environment, an environment that can kill us, but also an environment that lets us do things that there's no other way to do them nearly as easily. So my number one job as commander is to keep things safe for everybody. So I always check and make sure that everything we're doing, when you look at it, when you step back and think about it, we have backup plans. When the two guys that are outside on a spacewalk right now, that we have lots of reserve, that if something goes wrong, they have emergency tanks, emergency procedures. I think about all that. Or if we had a fire in here. The second thing I think about is I want this to be a good experience for the crew. They will be healthy and productive, will be a much better result if I take care of the people that are in my charge. So I also, as number two, as a commander, I want to make sure this is a positive experience. And then the third part is the science that we're doing. As soon as we're safe and healthy, then we can really get some science done. And this is an experiment that we strap to our chests, for example, that actually measures the flow of blood without having to get inside my body. It listens to the sound of the main blood vessels through my chest and records them, and from that can determine my whole cardiovascular system. It's a new experimental piece of equipment developed by a company in Maryland, and this is the first time it's been tested in really harsh 
uh, extreme environmental conditions where we can send this data back up to the laboratory and they can look remotely at the health of our bodies down here. So it's for safety as a commander, it's for crew morale and health, and then it's lastly to gather good science while we're here. Thanks, Chris. This question is from Isadora Baudouin from Chambly Academy in Quebec. That you have to do before going down to live underwater to prepare your body for the change. Isadora, uh, we are far enough down here that the air pressure crushes things. The, here's a, a can of these cocoa roast almonds again. Let me get up so you can see. So it, when you bring this down, it survives fine so long as you pop a little hole in the lid. But if you don't pop a hole in the lid, like with this Pringles can, when you bring it down, just the air pressure crushed this Pringles can. It completely crushed the, the can of Pringles because they didn't pop a hole in the top of it first. So think about the environment my body is in here. If we didn't properly prepare, then your body would get crushed like this Pringles can. So we have to make sure that we take a bunch of safety training to understand how scuba works. Think how your lungs work when you have that type of pressure. If I went outside and held my breath and moved up in the water, then it would be like filling this Pringles can back with air again, and my lungs would go to the point where they, they would put bubbles into my blood or burst. So you constantly have to think about the environment and what it does to you. So we took a lot of scuba training, we took a lot of safety training. If there's a problem inside the habitat, we have to be able to uh, react appropriately. And so we need all of the safety training. And then third, we needed all of the science training. What we're going to do outside to develop the spacesuits, uh, how we're going to use all the medical equipment. We even do blood draws because they want to test what happens to our body. And so we get trained to be able to draw each other or even draw our own blood while we're down here. So the training takes quite a while. An experienced scuba diver, an emergency medical technician, and a bit of a habitat technician all rolled into one to do the science while we're down here. Amy Leonard from Olds High School in Alberta. Please ask the next question. Uh, how was training for the NEMO mission different than training for a space mission? Thank you, Amy. Um, when I'm down here in uh, Nemo, in this Aquarius habitat, one of the guy who came to the window, his name's Nate or Nathan, and another fellow named James, they really are familiar with this habitat. They're the experts. If we have a problem, we will be able to react appropriately. There's gas masks and things, but they are the guys who really know the system. They're professionals who do for full time. Well, that's different for an astronaut. When I go to the space station, I am that professional. I'm the one who has to know everything about the vehicle, no matter whether we have a problem like a, a fire or a meteorite hits us or, or some sort of... Uh, th their main computer died on the space station yesterday during their spacewalks. And they had to go through a full computer reversionary mode and the cannon arm froze for an hour. And that type of training... I would need to be responsible for when I next go up to the space station. Here, someone else is providing the environment for us so that we can go do the science. So this one I only needed to train a few weeks for, whereas for the space station you have to train for several years just to get to the point where you can be a, a healthy and safe crew member. Great. Thanks. Josh Cookson from County Central High School in Alberta. Please ask your question. Do you believe in Aquarius and conducting any experiments outside of the base? Hey, mute your microphone now, I think, Josh. Okay. Um, thank you for the question, Josh. Uh, yes, some of the experiments are done inside like what changes on the human body, even our reaction time. They want to know when you work here, 
ended up on the space station, what it does to the human body and the human mind. But what we go outside for is to simulate three different things. One is, if you're building a spacesuit, how heavy can it be, and where should the weight be? Should it be far back? Should it be far forward? Should it, like, like wearing a great big backpack, but it's not as easy as it sounds, because if on the moon or on Mars, gravity is different. And so you might prefer to be heavy, or you might prefer to be light, and the center of mass, where the center of all your weight is, it might not be a, the place you would have thought. So we're doing all sorts of evaluations of where to put your spacesuit with a big test rig we have outside at all different weights. We're also evaluating a rover on the surface of a planet and a lander, how big the hatches need to be. How do you rescue a crew member that is injured and lift them and get them back inside in their spacesuit? How do you interact from the outside? How Something as simple as how high does a door sill or, or an entry platform need to be? And the third thing we're doing is if you've landed, if you, Josh, land on one of the big asteroids that's coming towards Earth, how do you explore it? What, what do you do? You, you don't have any good data yet. And so we use the weightlessness of water to explore a section of the reef here that is only very poorly mapped. And we have to develop as a team of divers or a team of explorers how to go out, build a gradual map while staying safe, while living within the con confines of our equipment. How do you run all those things and learn the lessons so that we can go and explore efficiently in the future? Thanks, Chris. The next question is from Cindy Levesque from Sir George Simpson Junior High in Alberta. In what ways are the internal environments of the ISS and Aquarius the same? Uh, thank you, Cindy. I didn't hear your question directly, but I heard Marilyn repeat it, so thank you for the question. Um, it's very similar here to being on the space station. It's noisy. You wouldn't think a space station or an undersea habitat would be noisy, but there's fans and pumps and radios and communication. So there's the constant sound of, of both of them. The size is about right. This had to be built and delivered in a truck to eventually get put in the water. The space station had to be built and delivered in a space shuttle up to the space station so that they end up being about the same size, about the same length and the same diameter. Uh, you're also living in a place that protects you from what outside would kill you right away. So you end up knowing that you're living in a bubble. Uh, but the big difference is this has six people in one habitat. The space station has six people in a, what is about six of these habitats put together that are living up there. So this one's quite small. We're only here for a couple weeks. The space station is six times as big although each one of the modules is about the same because they're up there for six months at a time. All right, we're going on to the next question from Julian. And our friends in Vulcan, you're going to have to moderate, please, because you're very loud and uh, it's, it's not clear. So on to the next question from Julian from County Central High in Alberta. Thank you for the question. Um, you're right. This place is more like Earth. We have gravity. The, this helmet is sitting on the table. I'm not floating around while I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm sitting still here. And we have a sink. So it makes it a little more familiar, a little more like Earth. Uh, but we don't have uh, a stove, so we just inject hot water. When we want to eat, we get, a package of, we get a package of food and we fill it with hot water, a hot water dispenser. That's exactly what we do on the space station. We get a package of food, we inject it, fill it up with hot water, 
and then here we eat it out of the package. In space, you can just float the package around. But that's the same. Um, let's see, the toilet. Uh, in space, the toilet uses sort of airflow instead of gravity. Here, we just go to the bathroom the same way the fish do. So that's uh, quite a different environment to just float outside and, and uh, like a whale or a seal or something to go to the bathroom. It feels very strange at first, but after a while it seems kind of normal. So going to the bathroom is very different. Um, we have better connectivity here. I can uh, have an intercom with you. I can call my family. Uh, we have internet available. On space station, there's a little bit of delay, and the further we get from Earth, the longer the delay will be. So home is what you make it. There are six people living in a small place, uh, but it feels sort of like home. And when I was on the Mir space station and the International Space Station, both of them felt like home also. It's more a mental attitude than it is the conveniences around you. Thank you. The next question is from Keith Coburn from Georgetown District High School in Ontario. Um, good day. Do you find that um, isolation is all needed in the Arcturus is similar to the tiny span space? And how different, uh, how like, oh, that kind of like office? Isolation, as well as the mood in um, Arcturus, is similar to the time you spend in space, and how well this benefits upcoming astronauts in the future. Thank you, Keith, and uh, I, I think you guys in Georgetown know I'm my I grew up near Milton, so not too far from where you guys are. Um, that's one of the reasons to come to this particular analog environment. Because you could just run a simulation like this I in an office. You could just close the door and have six people stay in an office for two weeks. But then you would know at the back of your mind that you're really just in an office. It's not until you truly get separated from humanity that you get some of the psychological effects. We know that we can't go outside and go up to the surface. It would kill us. Here, let me show you how. Here's a can of Coke. Now this can of Coke was bottled up on the surface. So I'm gonna shake it like crazy, and you know what would happen with this can of Coke if I opened it up on the surface. It would spray all over the place. But I'm gonna shake it, I just got it out of the cooler here, and I'm gonna open it right here by the TV and see what happens. And it didn't spray because there's so much air pressure here that, in fact, it's higher pressure than the pressure that's generated inside the can of Coke. When you see something like that, it still tastes a little fizzy, but the bubbles are really small. When you see something like that, you realize that you're in a different place. You have so much pressure on your body that a can of Coke won't burst that you go up to the surface, it'll kill you. So that really changes how you think about things. Same thing on a space station. And it's only when you get yourself in a realistic environment that then you can start thinking, wow, what does this really do to my perspective as a person? How do I treat my crewmates? How do we view safety? How do we view normal life? What becomes important to us? And there's a whole team of psychologists and psychiatrists and behavioral health pe uh, researchers that are looking at us and we're filling out questionnaires and they're studying how we behave because as we go, as you go further and further from Earth, uh, they want to know what you need. Do you need a, a, hol a holodeck? Do you need a complete virtual reality? What do you need to stay healthy and sane uh, when you live in an environment that is so different? And this is one of the early steps towards finding those things out. Vischer from WD Cuts in Alberta, please ask your question. Can you describe the routine building techniques that you use while on board Aquarius? Uh, yes, Jalen. Last night uh, we had hat night, 
here on space, or here down in the Aquarius. Um, we have to do a video report back to the top side once a day. And so for fun, everyone made up a homemade hat. And we thought it would be fun for our support team back on the surface if when they looked at our video, we were all wearing different hats. Um, we uh, write a blog every day, and we rotate around who writes the blog, and we all look at each other's blogs just to see how everybody's thinking. We all have together so that we have a chance to talk about the experience. And as, as the commander, I, I tried to make it sure that everyone really talks about how they're feeling. When you're isolated like this, you don't want one person to start building up feelings that they're not telling the other people about. Probably, if you feel something, everybody else is feeling the same sort of thing, or is going to, or already has. And so, in order to build team here, what I try and do is have events. Uh, I brought a guitar with me. This same guitar was on the Russian space station Mir. It's a special guitar that folds in half so that it can fit and be brought down to the bottom of the ocean inside a pressurized container. And so it gives us a chance uh, in the evening to sit and, uh, and play some music. We play, uh, everyone's been playing the songs that they like the best on, uh, off of their uh, various types of MP3 or, or players that we have down here. I'm just setting on my speaker here. So that uh, we've been sharing each other what type of music we all like. So we really want to make sure that people share the experience, that we see ourselves as a team combating the environment and the psychology around us, and, uh, and that we come out of this having learned as much about each other and therefore about the experience as possible. Brissette from County Central High School in Alberta, please ask your question. I heard your question, thank you, uh, about food. Well, it's very much like space station. Uh, we don't have a refrigerator and no freezer, and we don't have a, a really good oven or stove. All we have is a water supply that you can get hot water out of, and we have an ice box that will keep things cool for a little while. So most of our food is dehydrated like I showed you, like this. So it's sort of like being on a long camping trip. But we also bring candy. And peanut butter. Um, but we don't have very much fresh food. Um, and from the top side, every few days, they take a pressurized or a container with a real heavy uh, lid, and they put fresh food in. So every few days, we get uh, some fresh oranges or something. We drink bottled water, and we have irradiated milk. I can't find it. So that milk that'll keep for weeks. So it's. I don't know, it's maybe like living on a sailboat in the middle of the ocean for a long time, or being on a long backpacking trip up in the north where you have to bring all your food with you. The food's okay. There's enough food, but it's not, not fancy. Um, but it's good. Everyone's happy and healthy, and there's enough variety that we feel good. Thanks, Chris. Naomi Switzer from Olds High School in Alberta. Please ask your question. How do sleeping patterns differ in space and under the sea? Thank you, Naomi. The scientists ask exactly the same question. And so I'm going to show you what's on my wrist. This thing's called an Acta Watch, and it measures the motion of my hands, and it measures when it's light and when it's dark. And when we're up on, on the space station, we wear those for the whole six months because they want to know what your sleep patterns are. And they also even want to know while you're asleep how often you, you fidget and roll over or how often you wake up. And they want to know it here. Because interestingly, we found out that here in the Aquarius habitat, 
people's sleep patterns get disrupted very much like on the space station. It's because someone else is telling you your whole schedule and you have a big list of experiments to do every day and someone's told you this is when you go to bed and this is when you wake up. No matter if you're tired or not and no matter if the next day is a big day or a short day, you're working sort of to someone else's schedule in kind of an unusual environment. And so we've, we've found that, that those patterns change, but they change almost identically in space as they do when you get in an extreme environment. So we fill out reaction tests, we fill out post-sleep and pre-sleep uh, reaction tests, and uh, they're keeping track with these active watches. It's another way to really learn how the human body works and to make sure that when we go on a long voyage, we're not asking people to do too much or to do too little. That's really interesting. Thanks very much, Chris. The next question is being asked by Matt from County Central High School in Alberta. What changes happen in your body if you're underwater for a long period of time? Matt, uh, good afternoon. Um, let's see, if you're truly outside in the water, then, of course, it has, and we stay out for about uh, three or four hours at a time when we're outside working uh, on our experiments here. Um, of course, your skin doesn't like being underwater. Your skin loses all of its oil, so you get those kind of pruny fingers that you get maybe if you have a bath or a shower. Your whole body will start to feel like that because the natural oils of your skin get taken away. Um, but most of our time is spent here in the air, even though we're still underwater. Uh, everyone gets zits on their face because with the high pressure down here, the oil comes out of your skin and the high humidity, for whatever reason, they, they, they even call it, we're under saturation. That's what they call living here. They call it saturation face or sat face because uh, the balance of your skin changes. And so even guys as old as I am are getting uh, bad complexion while we're down here. Um, the longest anybody stayed down here is a little over two weeks at a time. But people have stayed in facilities like this for months, sort of like space station. And like anything else, the human body is pretty adaptable, and you can get used to it. You get to a new steady state, and, and the body does okay. So there are some small changes, but, uh, but overall, our body lets us live here deep under the ocean, and our body lets us live up in space uh, once it's adapted and reached a new level. Okay, we're going to move on to a question from Connor, also from County Central High School in Alberta. What does it feel like to be on the moon for that long, for that period of time? Connor, it feels a little uh, odd. I started to think yesterday, I've been down here for a little over a week, I started to think yesterday that I'm living in a cave. It, it was the first time my psychology was I'm not living in a normal place. I'm living in a cave. And it's you, you can see when it's day and night because the light diffuses through the window, but you don't see the sun. Um, so I think it has a negative effect on people. Like, like when I lived in the north of Canada, the winters are, are, of course, the days are very short and the nights are very long. So... I think people are designed, if you look at our rhythms, to see a regular pattern of night and day. And that's why we have the lights on and why on Space Station we run on a regular day-night cycle because the sun uh, isn't a reliable stimula, stimulus for the body anymore. And it's important, I think, for our health that we have that pattern of day and night. from Sir George Simpson High in Alberta. Please ask your question. Chris, I think we've lost. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. How does a high-pressure environment affect blood pressure and flow? Hey, that's a really good question. On, on uh, sun Sunday morning, we took blood and we gave blood. And uh, normally when you stick a needle in your arm to give blood, there's just a little bit of blood shows up at the top of the needle. We call it a flash of blood, and it shows that you got the needle exactly into the right spot. 
Well, the first few times we tried, we couldn't get a flash of blood. And we were thinking, well, shoot, we're not doing it right. But then we realized it's because the air pressure is so high here that when we stuck a needle into our vein, the blood didn't come spurting out. The air pressure is actually helping hold the blood in our arm through a little tube. So it's, it's sort of almost like having an extra encasing, an extra wetsuit or something squeezing on your body. And, and so it definitely affects how uh, you would treat some with a wound. Um, it changes my voice. The way my vocal cords work, I have to move my tongue more and push a little harder to be able to talk. You can't whistle down here because the air is too thick. When I try and whistle, I can't make the air go through my mouth normally in order to make a whistling sound. There's all sorts of little changes to your lungs and to your blood because you're living here under the water. It's a great way to study how the body works because we know how it works where you are in Alberta, but it's really interesting to see when you change one thing, the pressure, how your body reacts and what all changes. We're going to move on to a question from Ashley Parker from Old High School in Alberta. Have you personally noticed a difference in your cognitive performances between space, Earth, and Aquarius? Ashley, uh, yes. We actually measure our cognitive performance. We have a, a thing where we have to have a quick reaction time. And then we have to, s they do this thing where they give you a big number like 2,321 and you have to subtract 9, and then subtract 8, and then 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and then subtract 9, 8, 7, 6, and keep going for like three or four minutes and typing in your answers. And it's a really simple way to measure how clearly you're thinking. They measure it first thing in the morning, in the middle of the day, and in the afternoon, and in the evening. And when you first get here, you're so overwhelmed by a new place, just like being in space, that you don't do very well. But once you sort of get adapted after a week or two, you start to get your normal faculties back. And we've seen the same thing in space. And when you look at how you respond, it takes in space about a month, about 30 days, to get truly where you're adapted and everything's working and ticking just like normal. And I think that would be true here, too. I've only been here uh, nine days, but I can see how my body's starting to level off and react and get back to how I normally behave on Earth. Thanks. Omariah Charles from Lorne Atkins Junior High in Alberta. Please ask your question. Okay. How would medical emergencies be handled while on board Aquarius? And how does this compare to similar events while on board the ISS? Uh, that's a good question. We can't go to the hospital. We can't even call an ambulance. We're stuck. So uh, we have at least two people trained here as emergency medical technicians, same as on the space station. And typically, there are, uh, there's a, do a doctor as one of the astronauts, too. Several of the Canadian astronauts are doctors, and uh, one of our members of the crew here is a medical doctor. And we've had lots of little problems here with people getting cut or bang on their head or getting an ear infection, that type of thing. And so the doctor can handle it. We have a first aid kit, a little bit of medical kit. But if something serious happened here, they would bring a doctor down to us, and we would start getting ready to bring the person back to the surface. Takes a day or two. On the space station, if someone had, say, appendicitis or something serious, then we'd put them in the Soyuz. It would take a day or two and bring them back to Earth. So the same sort of thing. We have a lot of capability on board, lots of medical training. Uh, but if it's a really serious thing, then we'd go through all of the procedures necessary to bring them back um, and to take care of their life. Thanks, Chris. Giovanni Vaca from uh, Chambly Academy in Quebec, please ask your question. What are the dangers you face in your underwater walk? Giovanni, cool question. On uh, Saturday night, we went out for a night walk in the darkness. And as soon as I stepped outside, I looked into the distance, and right at the edge of the lights, a great big shark went by, bigger than I am. And when you look at the ground, there's rays, stingrays and manta rays that look like sand. And suddenly, this section of sand starts flying along with a big stinging tail sticking out of it. So one of the dangers we face is the local life, the local predators. But 
they're as scared of us as we are of them, so normally they stay away. The real danger to us is making a mistake, because if we miss just a couple breaths in a row, we die. We have to breathe, you know, every 10 seconds or so. And if we just start to miss a few of those, our bodies don't work anymore. So, uh, so we have to have a really good air supply. And the biggest risk we have is a pressure-related breathing problem. So we really take that seriously and have lots of backup procedures. Thanks. The next question is from Michaela Riesling from E.G. Gish Junior High School in Alberta. How do your spacewalks of 2001 compare with the feeling you have while diving underwater? Michaela, they're very similar. Um, you, you're working through a bunch of procedures. You're putting on a helmet like this. allows you to breathe in a place you wouldn't normally. You're looking through a visor, and you're going to a place that normally you'd never go to. Uh, the biggest difference is that here we have a little bit of gravity, and we put enough weights on our suits that we can stand and walk around, because we're practicing exploring Mars or exploring an asteroid. When I did my spacewalks on the space station, I was weightless, and so I could fly and just move around with my fingertips. And the third part of it is, what's around you. Here, when you look around, you forget you're underwater, and suddenly a, a great big grouper that weighs as much as you do goes by. And when I was out on my spacewalks in, in orbit, I'd be working away, and suddenly Africa would go by. And so that same sort of weird, uh, I'm busy, I'm doing something, but holy cow, I forgot where I was. This is an amazing place to be. That really feels the same. So it's a very good analog, a very good place to train for spacewalks. We're going on to the next question, Chris, and it's from Miriam Hassan from Chambly Academy in Quebec. In school, we often have fire drills. Is there some sort of drill that you have to practice on this mission? Yes, Miriam. Uh, we could have a fire here anytime. Uh, the first thing we want to do is uh, not have flammable things so we don't have any open flame. Um, we're controlling the mixture of gases. If we have too much oxygen, everything will catch fire. You know, in a 100% pressurized oxygen environment, just rubbing paper together, the, the static electricity would burst into flame. So we control the environment so that we aren't likely to have a fire. But if we do, there are gas masks, and they're plumbed into a separate system so that we can put gas masks on and breathe. And then if this whole place filled up with smoke or fire, we can actually quickly jump outside and float into a, a special little bubble habitat uh, that's around the corner that we call a cupola out here. And it's got its own gas supply. So it's sort of like if you take a canoe and you tip a canoe upside down and everybody puts their heads up inside the canoe where you got the bubble of air, it's like that. And we can all sit in there while we got the rescue forces out, and we could stay there for a while. So yes, we have fire drills, we have emergency procedures, but the best thing to happen is not have a fire at all. We agree with you. Liam McCurdy from Olds High School in Alberta, please ask your question. What is the biggest difference in testing technology underwater and in space? Liam, it's a great question because you really strike to the heart of analogs and simulation. Uh, I, I've been an engineer and a pilot and a test pilot my whole life, ever since I learned to fly airplanes when I was 15. And I've flown lots of simulators. And the thing you learn is that all simulations are wrong. Every simulator, even though parts of it are right, parts of it are wrong. And you need to, as a, as a person that's using that simulator to train yourself for something, you need to recognize what parts are right and what parts are wrong so that when you get to the real environment, you won't have made a stupid mistake. And we make stupid mistakes all the time. Uh, in space, we've had some uh, real surprises because one of, our, one, one of our simulators was a little bit wrong. Uh, there was one satellite we were rescuing 
and every time, this had worked perfectly in the simulator, but every time they tried to attach this big clamp to it, just touching it, it would float away because of the weightlessness. There had just been a little bit of friction in our simulator on the Earth. And the very first time that we took an F-16 fighter aircraft flying, it wasn't because they wanted to go flying, it's because the simulator was so wrong that it started going out of control going down the runway and it was safer to get airborne than it was to try and stop. And so we look at this simulator here uh, underwater and some things are just right, like how, how heavy you feel in the environment. Some things are completely wrong, like how much the water slows you down and puts drag on your body. And so uh, you have to pick out the things that are just right, recognize how you're going to put that into the technology that you're going to use, so that when you take it to sp even temperature, you know, this helmet wouldn't work in space because it goes from plus 150 degrees C to minus 100 degrees C. What would that do to this helmet? You know, it would, it would freeze up parts of it. So you have to think about the differences, draw the lessons that are appropriate and correct, and then make sure that the hardware you build uh, is going to work properly in the new environment based on the lessons that you learned in your simulator on Earth or under the sea. Let's move on to a question from Larissa, who is from Sir George Simpson Junior High in Alberta. What can you tell us about the communication technology that we use in our testing while on board the carrier? Larissa, we have um, several different ways of communicating. Uh, you can maybe hear some of them in the background. The simplest is we just have a speaker that we talk and we have a or we have a microphone we talk into and a big speaker on the outside, and it just sends our voice out through the water. It has to be a different type of speaker than the one in your school because water carries sound waves differently. But that's, I'm clear in my ears because the pressure's changing. But um, that's how we talk to the divers outside. It's just like a bullhorn or a hailer to go outside. We also are connected through wires up to a floating buoy on the surface and from that, we can send VHF radio. And we also have an antenna on a surface that connects us through wireless back to the ground or back to the land so that we can have um, internet capability. And I can, in fact, Skype. I can Skype with my family from here, so we have that. Um, but what we're doing right now is kind of interesting. When you go to Mars, uh, you're so far away that it takes radio waves the same amount of time as light. It takes minutes. If you said hello from Mars, it would take maybe 20 minutes at the speed of light for your radio transmission to get to the Earth. And then they see, oh, hello. And they say hello, and it takes 20 minutes to get back. So just to say hello takes 40 minutes. We're doing that right now. Every email we send and every communication we have back with our support team is on a delay of 20 minutes each way because we want to understand what that does to them how much insight they have, and what it does to us, how we become an independent team, and how much authority we have to have, how much training we have to have. If, if you are going to go to an asteroid, and, and one of you will, how much independence do you need to go and explore that, to go mine that, to go deflect that from hitting us? Um, and so we're trying to develop all of that as we move further and further from the world from uh, County Central High School in Alberta. It's your turn to ask a question. It's your turn to design the event. How long will it take to get done and how many people will be there? Thank you. Was that uh, Jacob asked that question? Okay. Um, how long will it take us to come back to the surface? Well, if we went straight up, then... Um, my uh, blood would boil like a can of Coke when you open it at the surface because I have all these gases that have been compressed in my blood. And so I have bubbles popping out all through my blood. And those bubbles would get pushed around by my heart until they got into one of my joints or they got into my heart and formed a big bubble or they got into my brain and killed me. And when they get into a joint, it hurts so much that, that you bend up and it's called the bends. And, because, and it does permanent damage to you. So we can't, as you say, we can't just go out to the surface because there's too much gas dissolved and pressurized down into our blood. So what we do 
is we take our habitat, which is normally open to the sea, where you can go to the end and just step right down into the ocean. What we do is we close the hatch and we slowly drop the pressure here. We slowly, as if we're slowly climbing in the water, over about 18 hours. As if you could go outside and take 18 hours to go 18 meters. And that allows you time, every time you exhale, you're giving off some of that gas that's safely, slowly coming out of your blood. And after 18 hours, we have the same pressure in here as at the surface. Now, of course, we're still 18 meters down. So what we do is, once we get ourselves back to surface pressure, then we quickly equalize with the local water, open up the hatch, go out, and go up to the surface, just like being on a scuba dive. But then we have to stay in Florida for about two days before you can get on an airplane, because, of course, going on an airplane, you go from the surface up to, you know, 10,000, uh, well, 36,000 feet or whatever, 10 kilometers. And so uh, that's even lower pressure. So we have to stay for a couple days. The doctors have to watch us and make sure that everything's healthy before we get back to normal life. So all in all, it takes about three days. Thanks, Chris. Next is a question from Laurence Robert Bernardo from uh, Chambly Academy in Quebec. My question is, how much time does it take to recover from being underwater for such an extended period of time? Uh, Laurence, you, if anybody who in the audience is a scuba diver knows that if, if you go down in the water and then you breathe air from a tank, that's sort of like squeezing pressurized air into your blood. The deeper you are, the more pressurized gas you get in your blood. And so if you dive down, say, to 30 meters, you have to come up slowly, and you have to pause at 5 meters for a few minutes just to let the gas out of your blood, even if you've only been in the water for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And in fact, the deepest you can go breathing air is on the order of uh, about 50 meters. If you go any deeper than that, you, you can't stay down there for any length of time without damaging yourself on the way up. It, your body just won't take it. So that's just scuba diving down. Even one tank, two tanks, you can only stay down for an hour, you know, maximum. So, um, and then you aren't allowed to fly an airplane for 24 hours afterwards because of the risk to your blood. So for us here, where we're down for weeks at a time, where we've reached full saturation of our blood at this pressure, it takes, as I said, three days. It takes a long time to, uh, to get your blood back to normal so that you go from this crushed can to a fully inflated can and nice and healthy when you get back to the surface. Thanks, Chris. On to our next question from Sam Cuthforth from County Central High School in Alberta. Yes, Sam, uh, you're asking about that oil spill. We're in the edge of the Gulf of Mexico here, and the oil spill was sort of where the Mississippi River flows into the Gulf of Mexico. It's a real mess. Uh, it is spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico, making a real mess. We still don't really even understand what we've done, you know, what damage there's going to be. Not much of it has washed ashore yet, but uh, the Gulf of Mexico comes around, and the Gulf Stream comes around the southern edge of Florida, and then it goes up the Atlantic side of Florida and goes by Newfoundland and goes across and actually keeps England and uh, Norway warm. The reason England has mild weather and the coast of Norway has mild weather is because the water comes from here in Florida. So that current might pick up some of that oil and send it that way, and if it does, it might come by here. But, but that's two mites in my sentence, and we don't know yet. We really don't know how that's going to behave. We're monitoring it. Our safety people are monitoring it. We're looking at it with radar sat, one of the Canadian satellites set up, that's up, plus a lot of other satellites. We're trying to understand how the uh, ocean is going to deal with all that oil and what we're going to do about it. And if it starts to look like it's going to threaten us, then we'd, we'd come up early. We'd start our desaturation and head to the surface early. Thanks, Chris. Angus Dawson Hunt from Beaconsfield High School in Quebec, please ask your question. What would be the main difference, do you think, between an underwater mission and the reality of being on Mars or the moon? That's a good question. Um, let's see, this mission is only two weeks, and I 
know the minute that it's going to end. I think if you go to, to the moon, we would go for longer because it's quite complicated and expensive to go. And you might stay for an indeterminate period of time, you know, three months, six months. When we go to Mars, with the engines we have right now, it takes six months to get there and six months to get back. And when you look out the window on the space station or you look out the window on the moon, you see the Earth out your window. When I look out the window here, I see the ocean and the fish. When you look out your window on the way to Mars, the Earth is just another star. And I think that psychological impact would be extremely large. Six months of nothing, of feeling alone and not being able to go outside. I think we really need to understand what that does to the body. Also, there's once you get away from the Earth, you have a radiation hazard, sort of like we have a water pressure hazard that we need to learn what, how to deal with. So I think the main differences are the sense of isolation, the sense of true remoteness. We simulate it here, but I only think that the, the first people that really go to Mars, when they get away from Mother Earth, when Mother Earth disappears into the distance, I think that's going to have a big psychological effect and one that we need to anticipate and, and deal with and, and keep those people's health and mental health uh, you know, over that long voyage. Okay, just a little more on that. They're not going to be from Earth after a while. They're going to see themselves as Martians after a while because Earth will be so far away that they will become residents of Mars. I think that psychological shift will happen. Thanks, Chris. The next question is from Jared Whalen from Georgetown District High School in Ontario. Realistically, after the next, uh, after this uh, experimentation, like the mission you're on, are we going to be able to send astronauts like yourself to Mars and asteroids and within the next decade or 20 years or so? That's an excellent question, Jared. Um, part of the answer to the question lies in do we have to or not. Uh, if the Earth was being threatened, you know, if we did something to our planet so, so it became uninhabitable, or if we saw an asteroid coming, and we're really just starting to look for the big asteroids that, that are like the ones that have hit the Earth in the past, if we knew something cataclysmic was going to happen to our Earth, then yes, we could go to Mars. We could go to Mars in a year. We know how to do it. It would just take a lot of money and a lot of effort, but it would keep our species alive, which we might decide is a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, but it's sort of like saying in 1905 or 1910, hey, are we going to be able to fly nonstop to Australia? Can I get on an airplane in, Tr in Toronto, just near Georgetown, and and fly to, uh, to wherever, to Tokyo. And in 1905, people would say, well, shoot, you know, we've only built a few little crappy airplanes and they don't go very fast. Yeah, we could probably do it, but, but it, we don't really have the technology yet. And I think we need to make that technology jump. The space shuttle can't go that far. Um, the spaceship the Russians have built is only really designed to go to the space station. We're starting to build new spaceships now that could go as far as the moon, but we need better engines. And there's a great engine being built by a former astronaut down in Houston that uses ion propulsion that uh, instead of a whole bunch of fuel coming out the back slowly, it uses a tiny bit of fuel coming out the back extremely fast so that you can go to Mars maybe in a month. And then maybe you can go to Mars if it only takes a month or, or even less. So it's, it's sort of like an evolution. When you look back at those airplanes from 100 years ago, you think, God, what a lousy design. And when we get 50 years from now, we'll probably look at the space shuttle and go, wow, what a lousy design. We just haven't invented the new things yet. So my prediction is yes, we definitely can and we will. 20 years is probably about a reason length of time to do that. So I think my answer to your question is yes, we will. Chris, we have less than two minutes, and this is going to be our last question. It comes from Eric Nitzer from Chambly Academy in Quebec. In your opinion, what, uh, what makes it worth the risk to venture into space? 
Uh, that's a good question, Eric. What, what makes anything worth the risk? Um, you know, you, people get in cars every day, and uh, you know that someone in Quebec is going to die in a car crash today, but you still get in a car because you think, well, you know, I'm probably not going to be me, and I need to get where I'm going, or a bus or whatever. Um, people get in airplanes every day, and they know that airplanes crash. Like, I think there was one this past week over in, uh, I read about it on the Internet, anyway. But you think, oh, I'm probably going to be okay. Uh, the question is, is it worth it? Is it worth taking the risk? And not everybody wants to, uh, but uh, for me, trying to understand the universe, trying to understand how the world behaves as a, as a spaceship, trying to understand what the moon does to it, to us, trying to understand if we're going to become like Mars, because Mars used to have an atmosphere and oceans, trying to understand everything that else that exists in the universe, it all starts with our initial step away from the Earth. Right now we have all our eggs in one basket. Everybody is here on the surface of the Earth. And the capability to leave that, to move beyond that, that's the same thing that, that you'll eventually move from your home for, the same reason you'll move away from your parents. That increases your risk, but it's also a natural part of being a human being. You have to go explore the world that you haven't seen. You have to increase your level of knowledge and understanding that that's part of being human. And we have built machines over time that allow us to explore higher and faster and more distant, and it's added to human capability. And I think exploring space is just the next step that led the very first caveman over the very first hill when they left Africa millions of years ago. Thanks very much, Chris. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to thank the folks that made this learning event possible. First, to Alberta Education, thank you very much for providing the technical bridge that has permitted so many students from three provinces to take part in this learning event today. To the educators and students that submitted such excellent questions, thank you very much. To our NASA colleagues that provided us with the access to the Aquarius facility, thank you. And a big thank you, of course, to Chris for taking the time to share his Sea to Space experience with students across the nation today. Thanks so very much. We wish you all great success for the rest of the NEMO 14 mission. Thanks.